David Fenkel, the genius of cello, <laughs> the mastermind of music business, the legend. I'm so old already. <laughs> <laughs> you're so young and you're the legend already. Thank you so much for talking with, with me today. Pleasure, Joy. <laughs> so, David Fenkel is a cellist of, was a cellist of Emerson String Quartet. I still can't quite transform myself into thinking as, as a past simple tense. I can't, I can't either, so that's <laughs> 33, 34 years with Emerson String Quartet, nine Grammy Awards, three gramophone awards, more than 36, 36, I was counting last night, 36 recordings with Deutsche Grammophon, the best recording label in the world for classical music. Um, two CDs with Sony, the last one, Journeys, with Tchaikovsky and Schoenberg. Director of Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. Founder, co-founder with wonderful wife, pianist Wuhan, of the most incredible music festival in California Music at Menlo. Co-founder and co-director together with Wuhan of Chamber Music Today in Korea. Let's keep going, there's more. I'm tired. <laughs> Tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of all my jobs. Artist led uh, yes. independent recording label with 16 CDs. There is so much. How does it feel to be David Finkel? It feels fantastic to be <laughs> me right now. I, I, I still have so many projects that I'm interested to do. I don't know where to begin. But fortunately, now that I'm out of the Emerson Quartet, and the Emerson Quartet goes on, by the way, with a brilliant younger cellist who's very eager to play all that repertoire. Um, fortunately, now I have more time to tackle even more projects. So check in with me in three months, and you'll probably find another another half dozen new projects that I've started. So you're expanding, expanding, and the sky is the limit. I'm I'm expanding, and I'm also you know deepening my my commitment to a place like the Chamber Music Society. To music at Menlo, I, I would like to make more recordings for Artist Led, my recording company. Um, I would like to play more concerts with more people that I meet. I would like to have more musician friends. Uh, it's all there and ready for me to to do it. And now I have some time. Well, when I was reading your blog for Huffington Post, as well as your own private blog, as well as watching your 100 cello lessons that are online, which are phenomenal. And every string player should have this in their curriculum and they should just watch it. Um, I had the idea that you have thousands of friends, musicians and, and colleagues that you meet and I just was overwhelmed by the numbers of what you do, how you do, whom you meet, how you manage to remember. So what's the daily routine of David Finkel? How do you manage? Do you start the day with the meditation to focus yourself because of your five millions of projects or you just go for it? You know, it's interesting you mentioned the, the idea of meditation because I have never formally done any kind of, of meditation or even physical exercise. I, I've never done anything like that. My, my exercise... Hard to believe. My ex fantastic shape. <laughs> my, yes, I, but I tell people that I have, I have health clubs all over the world. Uh, in London, it's called Heathrow, and in <laughs> Chicago, it's called O'Hare, and in New York, it's called JFK. No, really, because running from one gate to the other sure. in these airports, you know, you really work off some, some extra weight. But no, interesting about meditating, I, I realize that I do have a very interesting time of day that is between the time I wake up in my bed and between the time I actually get up. And sometimes I, I realize that when I first wake up, my mind is working better because it's so rested than, than it does the whole rest of the day. And so often I will lie in bed and just figure things out. Like if there are problems in front of me, even if it's something like rearranging the furniture in my apartment, uh, I can do that best while I'm still back like this and I haven't got up yet. Um, so I am having a little bit of meditation time, but it's not, it's not the kind of meditation where you, you wipe, sure. wipe it clean. It's the kind where you, you 
really concentrate and fix things mentally and visualize. So I have a lot of great ideas before I become uh, vertical. Uh, but then in the morning, I, I usually I usually try to stay with my own musical work in the beginning part of the day and to save all of the phone calls and the email and everything like that for, for later in the day because I'm, I'm a much nicer person if I've played the cello and my hands are warm and I, my, my calluses are, are nice and hard. I'm a much easier person to live with. You can ask me on that. Okay, I will. I surely will. Hopefully in the future, in the near future. Well, so what is the key to success and the key to the genius and what drives you and what keeps you um, going and how come that you just keep coming with these most incredible ideas? What, what is this? I have to pick the brains of David Fink. I have to. Well, I'm sorry. When I was very young, my, my parents were both musicians. My father was a professional musician. And it's a small family, only me as the child. And my father was a wonderful teacher as well. He, he was initially a jazz musician, then he went into classical, and he went into teaching young children. How interesting, from jazz to classical. Yeah. And his way of, of teaching was not to sit you down and, and make you to learn things, but what he, what he was best at is, was being excited about something himself. And I remember when I was young, he would, he would be playing a record, and he would say, wow, listen to this harmony. This, this melody of Rachmaninoff and how it does this, that, and because he was so excited, he got me excited about it. And, you know, I tell you to this day, I think it's kind of the way I do everything, not only in, in music, but even in, in planning and business and everything. I try to make myself as excited as I can about an idea, and then somehow people just, it's easier for them to understand it, to come along with me. But if you ask me, you know, how do you run a festival or how do you program this? I mean, I can't, I can't really teach that. I just do it. I do a lot by instinct. Uh, and I do a lot by, by what, what I really love. I mean, I don't program and perform music that I don't really love. I don't subject myself or other people to it. So everything that comes across my stages is something that I really love and I think is worthwhile for people to listen to. And I think if you use that as a guide, and as a principle, you can't really go wrong. Of course, music is subjective. I mean, you don't have to like the same music that I do. It doesn't mean that you're not a musician. Um, but when you're an artistic director, like I am here at Lincoln Center or, or elsewhere, that's what people want you to do. They want you to come and say, I'm excited about this. I think you should hear it. And so that's, that's, the, way, that's the way I do that. Um, in terms of just my own my own cello playing, I I have to say I love I love the feel of the cello and I love the sound of the cello. I love picking it up and feeling the strings under my fingers. I love the way the bow grips the string and, and the, the deep sound that it makes. And and so I, I physically love it. I love picking it up and touching it and making it speak. And so that's kind of an addiction. If I could, I would practice six, seven hours a day, just because I love, I love the feel of the instrument. It's so comfortable to play, and that was my first impression, and it's still that way all these years later. Well, fantastic to hear this. You just answered my very next question. <laughs> Why cello? So you picked the cello yourself. My cousins and uncle and grandfather and great uncle all played the cello oh. in my family, and the tradition in the Finkel family was that you play cello and you marry a pianist. <laughs> I, Here we go. I followed, I followed the <laughs> you family, followed the you know, the family tradition. tradition exactly. Um, no, when it came the time for me, I was ten years old uh, to to select a, an orchestral instrument because I'd already learned a little piano. Uh, my parents said, "Why don't you play the cello like your cousin Mike?" And I said, "Well, sure, get me one." And they got me a cello, and it came in one of those brown canvas bags, you know, with a zipper. And sure. I remember when I took it out. It was so beautiful, and it was a new cello, so it had this little smell of varnish that smells so good, and I got it out, and it was this beautiful, I mean, cellos are beautiful looking things, you know, they're beautiful shape, and they have beautiful wood, and, and, and you know, gorgeous, and then I, then I, you know, put the bow on the strings, and the sound came out, and I thought, wow, that's just great. So I was hooked from the beginning. Of course, then I worked two 
two very difficult years where I didn't sound so good. But you know, if you don't sound so good on the cello, it's not so bad as if you don't sound good on the violin. And I'm sure you would agree. <laughs> I and do. That's why. Absolutely. And that's why, that's why I, think, I think the Suzuki violin program is so successful. Because they start, they start children playing the violin when the children are only this big. And they're so young that they, you know, they scratch away and they don't realize how bad it sounds. Because they, they, don't, they don't have the discretion yet sure. and the critical ear. So by the time they get to be four, five, six years old, where they start to hear better players, sure. by the time they get that, they're already making good sound. Another question, your life is pretty much like a movie from everybody's perspective when we are reading your enormous, long biographies filled with thousands of events, beautiful concerts. I mean, just with Emerson String Quartet, you probably had more than 5,000 concerts in your mm -hmm. career. Now, the story with Slava Rostropovich, that's quite amazing. I heard a little bit from the grapevine. Mm -hmm. uh, would you just share the, the story uh, with us? How did you hear of him? How did you get to know him? How did you become his student? Well, when I was 10, I started with cello. And of course, my, my parents got me cello records. And I had some very nice cello records. I had uh, some box suites from Antonio Ianigro, the wonderful uh, Italian cellist. I had a Dvorak concerto from Leonard Rose. I had something from Starker, maybe. I'm, or maybe something from Piatigorsky. And I said, that's great, wonderful. And then one day, my uncle, who was a cellist, called up my father and said, I have a recording for you to buy for young David. And write the name down. And he said, it's spelled R-O-S-T-R-O-P. It was a long name. And so my father went out and found a Rostropovich recording of the Sanson Child Concerto. Came home and put that on. And as soon as I heard that sound, I knew right away this is the way I wanted to play the cello. It was it made a you know double triple impact on me from the other cello recordings. I'm not exactly sure why, because I was so young. What what why did I know the difference? But there was something about the sound, the intensity of it, absolutely the technique was, was so thrillingly clean and and amazing. It just I, I just got so excited. And so I started going nuts, finding every record of his that I could find. And then, of course, what was made it more complicated was that I heard how great these pieces sounded, like the Saint-Saëns concerto. And I said, I want to play it. And my father said, because he's a music teacher, he said, you're not ready. And I said, but I want to play it. So there was this fight in the family that I wanted the music. And finally, I got the music. And then I, I went running in, into my room and I play it, and then I come out, and I'm playing it all wrong. I'm playing all the wrong rhythms and everything, and my father looks at the score and says, David, this is all wrong, you can't, have... and so then there was more fighting about <laughs> how I was playing the Sanskrit Sutra. <laughs> so I would say that even from, from that time, 11, 12 years old, all through my teens, right up till 17, 18 years old, because of Rostropovich's um, incredible expanding project of the cello literature with these new concertos by Britton, by Prokofiev, by Shostakovich was more difficult than anything that had been written before. I was always getting this music and learning pieces that were too difficult for me and probably not playing them very well, but it, it pushed my level up higher because I was always looking towards something that was just a little bit out of my reach and I dare say that's the way that I, I, I got better because I was always going for something that was just a little out of my, my grasp. So that was the effect that he had on me. And Rostropovich is also a very interesting case. And I don't understand why. You know, I, I've heard from other musicians my age who study with great, great teachers and great players that, that you know, when they would go to their lessons and their teacher would play the instrument, or when they would hear their teacher on a recording or a video, that they would be discouraged. They would feel like they wanted to give up, like, oh, I'll never play as well as my teacher, and, or so-and-so, even if they're not their teacher, some mentor. And I have to say, as phenomenal as Rostropovich's 
cello playing was to me. I mean, I was just starstruck and amazed by this. He never made me feel like that. He always made me feel as though if I tried hard enough that I could do it too. And I don't know what it was about his personality that was that way, but I tried for myself as a teacher so hard to be that way. I tried to make the students feel it's possible for them to do it, not that I know everything and that they'll never get here. And that, you know what I mean? That's what the best teacher is. That's hard to do. That's and and that's sometimes you can be a great player, great player, but if you don't have that ability, ability. you actually shut people down Absolutely. rather than, than bring them up. And so now that I'm just begun teaching at the Juilliard School and, and, and continuing, continuing to do creative projects at Stony Brook University, I'm, I'm going to work on myself as a teacher. And I have not worked on that very much yet, but I want to become a really great teacher if I can. And so it's hard work and I'm, I'm trying to learn. Yes, you can. You have all the privilege of your entire past as a wonderful cellist and now stepping into solo career. Uh, tell us a bit more about your soloing that is up upcoming in the future seasons. I heard some Dvozhak, I heard some double drums, a concerto, triple, Beethoven. Well, well, you know, when I was, uh, like all of us, when I was in my teens, I, I learned to play the cello a lot from the solo repertoire. I learned all the sonatas and the concertos that I could, including the new ones that, that Rostropovich inspired. Um, and I've kept them over the years, but now really that repertoire is coming back into my life. And it's very challenging. I mean, these pieces are, are difficult. They're more difficult to play than, than string quartet cello parts. String quartet cello parts are difficult, but they're not as difficult as the major concertos. And so I have to, I have to make sure that my, my technique is at the, at the highest point it's ever been, and maybe even higher. And so for that reason, these days, I am devouring um, the A2 books that now the Popper High School of Cello Playing is back on my stand, as are the Grutzmacher books and the Kreutzer, and you know all of these etudes are there, and the Piatti, the, the wonderful Piatti Caprices. These are great things, and, and they, they make demands on you that are, that make it, once you deal with those demands, it becomes more comfortable to play the cello in general. So I can't recommend that enough, these, these etudes and, and the, getting them in, you know, in, under the fingers. You know, it's very exciting. I have a, a young cello student who's coming to me next year as a graduate student at the Juilliard School. And for his graduation recital, um, prior to coming to the Juilliard School, he played all six box cello suites and all 12 Piatti Caprices. So I don't know what I'm going to teach him. I'll, I'll find something to talk about. <laughs> I'm sure you will have plenty to teach. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful interview. It has, it has been great pleasure. You are a wonderful legend. We really would encourage everybody to come next year, uh, next season in September, October to Chamber Music Society uh, and hear David Finkel with Wuhan and with other wonderful musicians perform on stage right here in New York City. Congratulations on everything. Thank you you are much. truly inspiring, inspiring to all of us young musicians and we all look up to you and you are our mentor, our guide, our teacher, our inspiration, our energy and I just learned so much from your passion about talking about the music that I should keep my passion going and burning and maintain it and oh so boy I, I have a lot of work I'm, to do. I'm not, I'm, I'm not worried about your passion at all. I have a lot of work to do. Thank you so much David. Thank you. Thank you.